I am, I'm Tony Clark and I am the owner of Well Done Charlie, which is a dog training company based on Capitol Hill. Um, I serve, give, provide in-home services to um, clients on the hill and the surrounding area and I provide remote training for elsewhere in the district and in fact across the country. Um, I received my uh, certificate in training and counselling from Jean Donaldson's uh, Academy for De Dog Trainers. I'm also a certified separation anxiety trainer and I graduated from uh, Victoria Stillwell's Academy for Dog Trainers as well. In addition, I'm a member of the Pet Professional Guild and the Association of Pet Dog Trainers. So with that, I will um, bring up the uh, webinar. All right, so in thinking about which uh, direction to take this talk today, I spent some time reflecting on the amazing job that dogs do to adapt in real time to our ever-changing human world. It's their special skill, and it's enabled them to not only survive, but thrive, even as their Wolf ancestors face the threat of extinction. They eat our food, in our, they sleep on our sofas, and they even take over our beds. But despite their tremendous adaptation, many dogs still struggle with the noises, sights, and sounds of the city. I mean, urban living can be tough, even for us humans, and we understand what's going on. We may not like it when the the garbage truck rumbles down the street, but at least we know what it is. For many dogs, garbage trucks are just big, hulking monsters. Imagine if we looked out our window and saw this thing striding across the landscape. Would you continue sipping your tea? I think not. And actually, in 1938, we got a preview of just how such a thing might go down in Silver Spring or, or Bethesda or, or Capitol Hill. Because at that year, as some of you may know, Orson Welles, the famous actor and director, broadcast a dramatized version of H.G. Wells's science fiction novel, War, War of the Worlds, about a fictitious Martian invasion of a small commuter town in England. Orson Welles transferred the location to New Jersey and had the Martians traipsing towards New York City. It's one of the most famous broadcasts in history because it sent thousands of people running and screaming into the streets in panic. So humans are by no means immune to blind fear of the unfamiliar. So with this in mind, I thought I'd talk today about the function of fear how dogs come by it, and how we can alleviate it, whether it's fear of a specific trigger, such as the garbage truck, or multiple triggers. I'm increasingly seeing dogs come into my practice with a cornucopia of anxieties that collectively amount to a kind of existential fear of the outside world, what we might think of in human terms as a kind of agoraphobia. They don't want to go on walks. They may not even want to go into the yard. It's extremely stressful for both dog and owner. And, and what you're seeing on the, on the screen here is some of my clients um, who have um, experienced this kind of fear. Little Stella there in the middle, um, tuck on the left, refusing to go out, and Nelly up the, in, at the top there. The good news is that regardless of the trigger, we can go a long way to improving the quality of these dogs' lives. So let's step back a minute and look at the scale of the problem. I don't have hard numbers to back this up, but anecdotally, the number of fearful dogs in our area seems to be increasing, and even more so with this pandemic, where so many people um, have understandably wanted to get a dog. But there may be a couple of trends, additional trends, that are partly contributing to it. First, we're seeing a tremendous increase in urbanization. The amount of construction in our region is extraordinary. Right now, there are 214 projects underway in DC alone, 
covering nearly 30 million square feet. And there are nearly 700 more in the pipeline. So none of this is going to end anytime soon. And it's the same around our whole region. At the same time, we're seeing an unprecedented number of dogs who are coming into urban areas from rural areas, particularly the south. It's a trend that started following a slew of hurricanes in the early 2000s and it's been accelerating ever since. So to give you a sense of the scale of this migration, in 2014, the ASPCA shipped 500 dogs north. By 2018, just four years later, that figure had risen to 480,000. While it's wonderful that these dogs are finding homes, we can't ignore the fact that an unknown percentage may have barely seen a car, much less a city bus. Of course, it's not just rural dogs that experience fear. Any dog can exhibit any anxiety about any number of things, whether it's other dogs, people, balloons, balloons is a big one. It's not surprising because there are so many ways a dog can become fearful. They can be genetically fearful, they can become fearful through lack of socialization or through bad experiences. They can become fearful through the mother's experience and behavior. In fact, as is on this slide, fear is the easiest thing to acquire and the hardest thing to get rid of. It's woven into a dog's DNA and into their psyches in deep and complicated ways. So why would that be? Well, let's look at evolution. It may seem obvious, but fear is one of the tools evolution gives us to ensure a species survives through time, from generation to generation. It's why most of us become, become pre-programmed with a fear of heights. We can't learn the hard way that heights are hazardous in the way we might learn that touching a hot stove burns. If you fall off a cliff, you're dead. There's no learning. So we come with that fear pre-installed. And to give you an idea of how tightly evolution is holding on to the scruff of our necks, let's look at how our bodies react to the mere idea of falling. What I'm about to show you is Alex Funnold, who is a, a, a climber who um, climbs up mountains without Alex's genes obviously didn't get the message. And in fact, you can see that using modern technology. Fear is mediated by the amygdala, this almond shaped collection of neurons located in the brain that help you feel certain emotions, including fear. When Alex's brain was compared in an MRI machine to that of another climber, and both were exposed to a series of images that you would expect to elicit a strong reaction, the climber on the right's amygdala lit up 
like a Christmas tree. It's right there where those, where the in the middle of the cross. Alex is on the on the left is stone cold. There's not not even a flicker of life there. So if the human race were made up of people with Alex's genetic makeup, we would be rapidly heading for extinction. John Long, who is a well-known climber in climber circles, which are not my circles, by the way, um, but he was once interviewed and said, people who've made a habit of free soloing, that's going up mountains without ropes, more than half of them are dead. What all this means is that fear can be entirely genetic. And it's thought that in dogs, noise, the kind triggered by fireworks or a motorbike backfiring or the pop of gunfire is in fact genetic. And you can imagine why that might be. Animals with hair trigger responses could in certain circumstances have an evolutionary advantage. This genetic imperative to survive also explains why dogs, and indeed most animals, default to fear in the face of the unknown. It's prudent from evolution standpoint that we take a better safe than sorry approach when confronting a potential hazard. When in doubt, be afraid. This tendency for animals to default to fear also explains why vets and trainers put so much emphasis on socializing young puppies. It's much easier for dogs who are exposed to city sights and sounds in the first three months of their life to cope later on. That's because nature has provided a critical window during which the automatic fear response has not yet kicked in. Puppies are open and curious. Experiences during this period are catalogued and go into the known column. As long as these experiences are happy ones, the dog is more likely to be immunized when he comes across those things later in life. The positive news from our point of view is that fear, even hardwired fear, can be modified. If your dog is extremely fearful, it's always wise to talk to your vet about it, as they may be able to prescribe helpful medications. The behavior modification part of the equation is where trainers come in. And the gold standard protocols that we use to alleviate fear are systematic desensitization and counter conditioning. Sometimes these protocols are used separately, but most often, they're used in combination as a one-two punch. But before delving into these protocols, I'd like to step back briefly to remind ourselves how dogs learn, because it's very relevant and we need to understand it in order to execute this program correctly. So, dogs learn in two ways. The first is by figuring out that certain behaviors produce certain consequences. If I sit, then I will get a treat. If I bark when I'm asked not to, then I will get a 30 second time out in the bathroom. The dog can operate on his environment and adjust his behavior in real time. We call this operant conditioning. The second way dogs learn is by noticing associations. If this happens, then that happens next. If human picks up the leash, then we go for a walk. If she puts on her high heels, then I'm left alone for eight hours. This is known as classical conditioning. The dog can't operate on his environment. He can only notice and prepare himself. And this is the system we surf when we're working with fearful dogs. It's important to note that when we use classical conditioning, we don't need the dog to do anything. Think about it. If we ask a dog who is fearful in a certain situation to do a behavior, such as sitting, it would be like me asking you to play the violin in the midst of an armed robbery, when your adrenaline is yelling, run, save yourself, 
a lot of my clients will say, well, you know, uh, he won't sit, he, he sits very well um, unless, he's, unless he's fearful and then he doesn't listen. So we want to make sure that we, that we sort of explain that this is not, uh, this is not related to behavior. So let's dive in a little bit more in a little bit more detail to this desensitization and counter conditioning. So desensitization, what does it actually mean? Here is Jean Donaldson's definition. Jean says, desensitization is a therapeutic technique whereby a fear evoking stimulus is present at an intensity that elicits no fear and then it is gradually invited the subject continues to show no fear. Counterconditioning, on the other hand, teaches the dog that the fear evoking stimulus, which is not fearful when it's at a, a, a low intensity, predicts wonderful things. It sounds simple on the surface, but the devil is very much in the details when it comes to successfully executing this protocol. And there are many ways a desensitization and counter conditioning plan can go off the rails. And I'll get to a number of them a bit later, but here's the big one. The main mistake people make is that they go too fast. Modifying fear requires a tremendous amount of patience, which can be tough, not only for owners, but for trainers too. We're all used to snapping our fingers and getting what we want, whether it's food or a movie or a book. If we send an email and we don't hear back within a few hours, we start getting itchy. And if we send a text, we expect a response within minutes. As for Snapchat, you'll have to ask my 15 year old niece about the rules, but as I understand it, if you don't respond almost instantaneously, you will be found guilty of airing someone, which apparently means leaving dead air in the conversation, and it's considered extremely bad form. Dog speed is a whole different ball of wax. When we're looking to alleviate fear, we have to go at the dog's pace. And the dog's pace is dictated by biology, by his nervous system. To give you an idea of how far removed dog speed is from digital speed, consider how people used to communicate in the olden days of pen and paper. I wonder how many people on this webinar have ever sent a letter overseas or even a letter period. Perhaps not many. Even those of us who are old enough to remember letters and airmail have to imagine ourselves further back in time to simulate dog speed. Don't think 21st century or even 20th century. Don't even think 19th century. Think 18th century. Think Jane Austen and dear Mr. Darcy. So David Henkin, who wrote a book called The Postal Age, points out that in 1799, a letter's round trip journey between Port and Maine and Savannah, Georgia, typically, typically took 40 days. And that most people wrote without even expecting a timely reply. 40 days. Now we're in the general ballpark of dog speed. When we're looking at alleviating fear, think weeks and months rather than hours and days. If you take away nothing else from this presentation, take away this, that the process of desensitization is slow. Alex Honnold, our fearless climber, who against all odds is still alive, puts it this way, and I really think it sums things up. He says, if I have learned one thing from climbing, it's the power of incremental progress. I often think I'd like to have that on a t-shirt, actually. If you go too fast, not only will you not have success, you run the risk of making things worse, a phenomenon we call sensitization. Sensitization occurs when the uh, body and mind are repeatedly paced, placed 
in an excessively fearful situation. It's similar to what we experience when we watch a horror movie. We spend two hours biting our nails and braced for the bloody head to drop out of the closet. And when the movie's over and the lights go out, chances are we're likely to startle at every shadow or every time the door squeaks. That's sensitization. So let's look at an example. Let's say I'm a therapist and I'm treating you for snake phobia. What I'll initially do is establish what version of a snake you can tolerate right now. For the sake of argument, let's say you can tolerate cartoon snake here. As part of your therapy, I promise you that I won't expose you to any version of the snake that you can't handle. And every time you look at car this cartoon snake, you'll get a cupcake. You say, great, we shake hands, and for the next several weeks, you come by every day and look at cartoon snake and get a cupcake. After a while, you start to thoroughly enjoy our, our visits. On the fear scale, we call this threshold number one. You are feeling no fear. As your inexperienced therapist, I now decide you're ready to progress to the next step. And for my next step, I produce this. You'd probably startle. You might look away, then look back. I'm taking it off the screen in case anybody's squeamish, <laughs> but you get the idea. This would be too much. And, but I, as your therapist, might be thinking, look, no, you're not leaving the room. You're still nibbling at the icing on your cupcake. Even though you'd basically like to go home, you're not panicking. This is what we call threshold two. And I, as your increasingly overconfident therapist, I'm thrilled. I think, wow, you didn't leave the room and you continued nibbling on your icing. Great. So I push forward. And the next time I'm going, I, I push, I drop an actual King Cobra in your lap. At this point, you'd be screaming bloody murder and running for the hills, and you'd probably be ready to shy away from anything that even resembles a snake, such as a stick. This is threshold three. It's sometimes called flooding. So, when executing a desensitization and counter conditioning protocol, be a snail. We want our dog to be happily taking treats, not taking them and then dropping them or taking them but still looking worried. We want him happy and wiggly at all times. We want to stay under threshold two. So let's see what this looks like in practice. This is a former client, Tuck. It's a four year old English setter rescued from a rural hunting dog mill. His guardians contacted me last year saying fear had taken over his life. He was scared of sounds, scared of people, scared of going outside, even into the backyard to pee. And walking him was a huge struggle. Tuck would just choke himself to get back to the house. Over time, he started growling at the dog walker when the dog walker came to take him out. And indeed, he started growling at anybody coming into the house. And then finally, one day, he bit the dog walker. And that's when they contacted me. So what did we do? First, we shrank his world right down. We took King Cobra out of the room by stopping street walks altogether. Above all, we wanted Tuck to feel safe, to bring down all the fight or flight hormones that had been flooding his body. Our plan was to expose him to the world again, but only slowly and carefully. So instead of trying to leash him, the dog walker simply came to the house and played go find it with pieces of chicken, tossed those pieces of chicken around the room and tuck chased them. He soon started to love it when the dog walker came. Our next step was to play the game with the door to the backyard open. And then, when he was completely comfortable, we moved the game into the backyard. He was exposed to outside sounds, 
but they were at a bit of a distance. Once he was happy in the backyard, we moved to the front yard. This was more difficult because Tuck could not only hear the traffic and the people, but he could see it as well. So we introduced two different types of treat. One for the find it game, which you're seeing here, and an extra special one that he would get if there was a particularly loud noise, such as a car horn or a siren or a motorbike. This was an important step because if we pushed the disc, then a, a sudden sound when he was out 100 feet could have sent him scurrying home and reluctant to, tr to try that distance again. So once he developed some padding towards the sounds, we moved into the street. Here, dad is acting as a target and delivering chicken outside the gate while mum provides moral support inside. Next, we move dad further down the street. As you can see, Tuck hesitates briefly, but with a little encouragement, soon takes off. Next, we introduced a kind of ping pong so that Tuck would get used to being on the street. Mom here is delivering the high value stuff while dad is delivering measly kibble. Tuck is quickly learning that the best treats are further away from the gate. Next, we push distance. You'll see Tuck is as happy as Larry to bound down the street to get his treats. Have you ever seen such an adorable lope? <laughs> so then after that, we you'll see that what he's doing here is he's running to a target. We have a human target either mom or dad who he's running to. Next, we're going to remove the target, which makes it more difficult. It's sort of the equivalent of going up a mountain facing in compared to facing out. So you'll see that this step is actually too hard for Tuck. He's too eager to get home. What I was watching for is a loose body on the way home as well as on the way out. So this is the threshold two that we talk, talked about. He's taking the treats, but he's not thrilled and he wants to get home. So we just dropped back and gave him some really easy wins. Next, we pushed to no target again but just for a short distance. You see he's, uh, he's, he's going to this first tree, which is um, the, the, the place where we've established that will be, the treat will be delivered. And then finally, we go back to no target and full distance. And here we have a happily walking dog who's not only walking happily, but is willing to and along the, along the route as well, as you'll see. So Tuck's progress wasn't linear. There were setbacks, as there are in any desensitization program, but we went at Tuck's pace, and here he is. <laughs> okay, so we've talked a lot about the rules for successful desensitization, namely staying below threshold two. So now let's look in more depth at the rules for classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning, as we also call it, after the Russian scientist who accidentally discovered how it all works. Classical conditioning is the tool we use to teach a dog that the thing he thinks is scary is actually very good news. Scary thing predicts terrific, terrific thing. And we call it counter conditioning because we're countering a view he already has about the thing. It's not a neutral stimulus. So rule number one, we need to make sure we get the order of events right. The scary trigger must come first and then the stake.
or the chicken or the cheese. The trigger, in other words, must act as the tip-off that the good stuff is about to occur. It can't act as a tip-off if the food comes first or at the same time. Rule number two is we want to make sure that there's a reliable relationship between the trigger and the steak. By reliable, I mean the trigger needs to predict steak every single time. There needs to be a one-to-one -one ratio between the two. The reason for this is that dogs are constantly scanning their environment, looking for clues that will tell them what's going to happen to them next. They want to be prepared. So if you show him a scary postman 50 feet away and you feed him steak on Monday and then on Tuesday he sees the postman and there's no steak, he'll say to himself, oh, yesterday I thought it was the postman that predicted steak, but today I didn't get steak, so it can't have been the postman. Perhaps it was the time of day or perhaps it was because she was wearing boots. Consistency is absolutely vital. Rule number three is we want to make sure that nothing else is competing with our trigger as a potential predictor of food. Let's say we're trying to get our scared dog, let's call him Chauncey, to like it when other dogs lunge at him on leash. So you ask your friend to bring their lunging dog to meet you across the street at four o'clock. You know from rule number two that you need to feed Chauncey every time a lunging dog appears. So while you wait for the kids to come home, you cook up the steak. At about 3.30, you take the steak off the grill and spend some time chopping it into small pieces. You put the sandwich bag into your treat pouch, clip it on, then leash Chauncey and head out the door. What are the chances that Chauncey is going to identify the lunging dog as the predictor of steak. He has a long history of treat pouches predicting treats, a bag crinkle predicting treats, and of food smells predicting treats. He knows, even before you go out the door, that steak is on the way. The lunging dog adds no information and is no tip off at all you will get no conditioning. We therefore need to make sure that our stimulus dog or our scary trigger comes into the environment first, that our dog notices him, and then other things such as bag crinkle, pocket reach, um, etc. come into play. That means we have to prepare the food the day before so that cooking and preparing are not predictive. You'll need to hide the meat in a smell-proof container in your pocket half an hour before leaving the house. You'll also need to vary the times of day at which you conduct your trials so that Chauncey doesn't learn to say, I love it when it's four o'clock, rather than I love it when another dog appears. Next, our trigger must ride alone. So this goes back to what we were talking about before. All the happy talking and the pocket reaching and the bag crinkling, they start after the trip, after the dog has been noticed. If we get our order of events right, if we feed steak every time our trigger appears, and if we make sure there are no other tip-offs, then we should get this. Our dog is going to anticipate steak every time another dog appears and will come to love the sight of other dogs. One final thing, it's important to stop feeding as soon as the trigger ceases to be present. We call this open bar, closed bar. The trigger happening makes the bar open and treats start flowing. The trigger stopping or going away makes the treats stop flowing. This clarifies in our dog's mind that it's the trigger that's responsible for good things appearing. Here's how it works in practice. This is Nelly, who's afraid of elevators, of everything actually, but at this point, we're working on the elevator. 
you'll notice how mom waits for the elevator to ping and the doors to open before she starts crinkling her treat pouch. And she stops feeding as soon as the elevator doors close and it goes away. Nelly's found severely malnourished in an abandoned crack house in Puerto Rico and brought to DC. She now lives in a 10th floor apartment near Union Market. So, so it's a noisy environment. Mom contacted me shortly after getting her, saying that Nelly was super fearful of everything, including the street, the hallway, the elevator, and any new person coming into the apartment. She said Nellie had initially accepted her boyfriend and a couple of friends, but now won't go near people or other dogs or outside. Between the time I got the call to the time of our appointment, Nellie had deteriorated to the point she was ultimately growling, lunging and barking at anyone other than mom. So we worked on a plan similar to Tux, but with variations due to location and different triggers. First, we stopped taking her outside to the street. She was lucky insofar as she has this apartment, uh, this like courtyard outside the apartment, even though it's on the 10th floor. So she could pee and poop and take treats and habituate to the sounds from quite a height. Next, we started making the hallway the place where treats and games happen. This is, you know, a number of sessions in. Initially, she wouldn't even come out of the uh, out the apartment door. So we practiced with cheese, and then eventually um, increased uh, and added the uh, the tennis ball and chase to make the hallway a great fun place. We gradually moved closer to the elevator and began feeding extra food when the elevator makes it pinging sound. So she had, she was playing with the ball and then the elevator would ping and she gets cheese. We saw that earlier. Here she is with her first tentative crossing the threshold and you can hear mom and her roommate are doing a great cheerleading job. So we keep the door elevator, elevator door open. And you see how generous they're being. So now you can see that Nellie is quite happily stepping across the threshold to get her steak. And again, really notice how generously mom is paying. That's so important. We want to really make an impression in these situations. So over time, we progress in incremental steps down to the lobby, through the lobby, through the door, out onto the street, and over time, uh, uh, down, the, down the street um, and round the block, and then to a normal thing. And here we are putting it all together, um, a nice walk on leash, all the way from the apartment uh, to the elevator and down through the lobby. And you'll see that she's here she's walking on leash. That was an, um, an additional parameter that we added um, and that took some extra work because when she uh, originally had the harness put on, um, she went back to uh, make it, it was very difficult for her. So we had to um, come back on certain other parameters such as distance um, from the apartment, etc., etc. So there was some repetition but it went much faster once we added the harness and the uh, the leash. And what you'll notice is when she gets into the elevator, she immediately puts her head, she looks down, anticipating the food that's about to be put down. She's already saying, I love getting into the elevator because I know food is going to um, appear. And here we go, we're out into the lobby and we added the lobby and gradually, gradually increased the difficulty. We did the, um, the door separately because it's quite a big heavy door 
um, and then this one as well, and then out we go. And we gradually increase the distance uh, that she's walking down the, the street. So our target on this particular trial was that first poll where we stopped her party. And even though she might be willing to, go, to continue, we've identified that poll as the party place because we don't want her to go further than she's ready and then find that she's too far. You know, like if you swim out too deeply and then suddenly find, oh my God, I'm so far out, I'm terrified, and get back. So we keep her within a comfortable place. And then here she is, a little bit further, going down uh, increasingly happily. She goes. I love her little, her little waddle. And then finally, there we are. She's walking like a perfectly happy city dog. So that's a, a, a really um, a happy transformation for, uh, for Nelly. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you found it helpful. And I'm happy to to take any questions. I'll put myself back into you. Tony, there are a lot of very good questions. I'm gonna start with the oldest ones. Um, Carol wants to know what you do if your dog gets so focused on something like a bicycle or a skateboard that she won't listen to you or respond to treats. Yeah. So, um, if you have a dog that gets focused on a squirrel and or a bicycle and they're not afraid they just uh, either want to get to the squirrel or want to even get to the bike and chase it what I would do there in the situation that is not where the dog is not fearful um, is I would use um, a, a, I would teach an alternate behavior um, so I would teach for example um, a watch me or a leave it or something that is an alternative behavior to the focus and then I would practice it first of all in a situation that was easy for the dog like in the house and then graduate um, to a quiet street so that you increase the difficulty um, you're not going to sort of immediately expect the dog to do it while you know, 10 feet away from a bicycle or 10 feet away from a squirrel, you build that up. Okay, then we had a question from Courtney. What is the best way to handle an oncoming dog? My dog wants to play with every dog he sees. Sometimes he goes quite crazy and I'm afraid he will knock me down. Yeah, it's such a common problem in, in the city. And again, if you have a dog that wants to get to another dog and is um, is not fearful, so you know is happy to play with other dogs off leash, but is sort of more frustrated and says, I, you know, I want to get to the other dog, I want to get to the other dog, I can't wait, I'm, I, I, I'm just going beside myself. Um, it's a little bit similar to the, to the previous questioner. I would teach an alternate behavior. Um, uh, and I would also give the dog plenty of off-leash play with other dogs to get some of that frustration, to let some of the pressure out of the cooker um, and diminish the sort of, I have to get access to, to other dogs pressure. Um, and then teach an alternate behavior. Again, I like leave it um, and I like watch it, uh, watch me. now. If you are so close that there is no opportunity for you to, to, to implement that, I would just turn and go, like teach a turn and go, um, get out of dodge and then feed. Because we want the dog, your dog, to have a positive experience of interacting with the other dog, even if it's frustrating. But with both these questions, what I would recommend is that you train an alternate behavior that is incompatible with fixating or with lunging. And that's something which you would work on, as I say, 
starting what can the, what can your dog do right now can he see another dog at a hundred yards without going off yes or no if he can okay great can he turn and look and look at you at you know 75 yards yes or no no good then we have to uh, practice it more at that distance and then gradually reduce and reduce the distance so there are various parameters that you would implement in a um, in a training plan that you would create Samantha wrote, is making a dog sit when they're distracted by an oncoming dog not good? She's read conflicting advice about this. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's neither, it's, I wouldn't say it's, um, it's bad. If you can, if your dog will sit and look at you when another dog is, is approaching, if your dog is not fearful, that's perfectly fine. If another dog is coming, your dog is excited to get to the other dog and you can have your dog sit and watch you while the other dog goes past, perfectly fine. If your dog is fearful, however, he's afraid, then asking him to sit is, I would, uh, I would argue, is not a good thing because there we go back to our asking you to play the violin when you're in, a, a mid, a, in, a, in the middle of a bank robbery. So if you have a fearful dog, then uh, um, asking him to do a behavior while he's fearful is not going to really work. He's, his mind is not in the position where he can actually learn anything. It's just fight or flight. But if, if you can teach a really solid sit in the house, in the yard, proof it amid increasing numbers of distractions and then when you see another dog have him sit and look at you for treats you get give him treats while the other dog goes past nothing wrong with that june's dog is sensitive to noise she startles at noises and is also reactive toward other dogs it seems like a fear aggressive reaction Okay. Um, can I? Is it possible just to ask a, 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 a quick question? Is uh, is 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 your dog? Is the questioner's dog? Um, does the questioner's dog play happily with other dogs off leash? Okay, with some dogs, but not others. Okay. Okay. Good. So you have a dog that may is 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 frequently uncomfortable with other dogs and is sensitive to noise. So your dog is um, more in the category of the dogs that we've talked about today. So I would, uh, I would suggest that you speak to your vet first and foremost um, to get their take on whether there is anything that can be done um, in terms of um, you know, medical ph pharmaceutical intervention that could be helpful, um, or vet behaviorist, you know, either. Um, and we have some very good ones in our area. Um, so that's one side. And then the other side would be to um, build up a training plan a little bit along the lines that, um, that I've been talking about. But in your case, unlike the two dogs that um, you know, from the previous questioners where we were talking about dogs that are not upset. In your case, your dog is upset. So what you're going to want to do is keep distance. And whenever your dog, you're going to feed something really lovely like chicken. So every single time your dog sees another dog, you feed, feed, feed. And if you're too close and that your dog won't take food, that's where we're either in a flooding threshold that we talked about or threshold two, just turn, get some distance, and feed. You want to feed every single time your dog sees another dog so that whenever he sees another dog, he starts to say, well, you know what, actually, I thought I was afraid of those dogs, but funnily enough, every time another dog appears, I get chicken. Well, maybe they're not so bad. And then you're going to uh, adjust your distance. You start off at a distance where, you know, your dog can, um, uh, can uh, happily take treats. And then if you get ambushed, if suddenly a dog appears around the corner, 
turn and go and still feed. Jennifer wants to know about um, barking and lunging at bikes, scooters, other moving things. Yeah. So again, very, uh, uh, very, very common, especially obviously among uh, herding dogs. Um, and similar to the two initial questions, where you have a dog that is not necessarily upset, but is kind of lunging or, um, uh, or, or barking at something because they want to chase it, they want to get to it. So in that case, you know, I'm making uh, an assumption here. I, I could be wrong because I don't know your dog and I can't, uh, you know, I can't make a, you know, I can't, uh, I can't know for sure. But if your dog is not upset but just wants to get to these um, things, again, I would teach an alternative behavior. Start by teaching in a um, in an environment <clears throat> that is very non-distracting and then gradually increase the levels of distraction. And a, tra a, tra a good trainer will be able to help build a plan like that. And you start with distance and increase that narrow distance over time. So any dog who, uh, you know, a dog can't lunge and bark and leave it, turn to you and watch you as you walk past at the same time. So an alternative behavior, training an alternative behavior to do in those circumstances is really helpful. Christine wants to know what to do if you can't eliminate all street walks because you have no backyard. So that is a really legitimate and, uh, and difficult um, problem and if you have no backyard if you live in a, an apartment building for example um, sometimes I don't know your your situation but sometimes they have rooftop uh, dog runs sometimes they'll have a bit of a terrace um, or the apartment might have a bit of a terrace if not if you cannot if there is literally nowhere no balcony no rooftop nothing I would suggest starting with pee pads or some kind of um, uh, turf, a tray of turf, anything to avoid having to put the dog repeatedly into a fearful situation. Because every time you expose him to intense fear, all these hormones, flight and, uh, fight and flight hormones, uh, flood his body. So. You go out on Monday into the street, he's terrified, maybe he manages to pee and poop, but he's absolutely terrified, heart pounding, cortisol flowing, he gets back inside, phew. But those hormones, cortisol, can take, you know, up to 72 hours to dissipate. So if then the, sec the next day you take him out again and the same thing happens, he just never gets the opportunity his body never gets the opportunity to fully relax, to fully come back into balance. So in those situations, I uh, generally will say, let's find a way to um, teach him to eliminate on, a, on, a t on turf or on pee pads while you are training him and teaching him to love or her to love going out, you know, down the hallway and, and gradually out the building, etc. And you can pick a turf or a surface that is going to be similar to the surface that uh, he or she will eliminate on eventually. June wants to know why conditioning always involves a treat. How do you know that the dog is actually learning and not just searching for the food? And then a backup question from her is why not use other modes of positive reinforcement? So, um, good question, and there's no, um, there's no reason in theory why uh, you can't use other methods of reinforcement. Um, and there are some dogs for whom, you know, tug 
uh, or fetch is more rewarding, you know, think of your border collies, um, is just as rewarding, if not more so, than, than food. But for most dogs, the easiest, uh, the mo for most dogs and most people, the easiest form of reinforcement is food. It also kind of sends dopamine to the brain. If we feed our dog sausage um, or chicken or cheese, it's like, you know, for a fearful dog, it's like, you know, chocolate or ice cream or something. So it has the same effect um, that when we when we're upset, we eat ice cream that it does on us. So it's a matter of it's universal. All dogs, healthy dogs, are going to respond to, to food unless they are too scared. If they are over threshold and they're too scared to eat, and that's a very good sign that they are way too, 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 in too fearful a, a mode. And you'll need to get more distance, uh, lower the intensity. The dog won't eat, that's a good sign. Um, that's why that's why we tend to use food. It's just universal. It's easy. You can carry it anywhere. You can use it anywhere. Um, and uh, and yes. And then there was a, a, a first part of that question: How do you know if a, if the dog is is being conditioned and not just looking for the treat? Again, very good question. What you you're going to you want to make sure that. Um, that you get that order of events right. So let's say you're training the dog uh, to like another dog, the sight of another dog. You are going to um, wait until your dog sees the other dog and then you're going to wait one beat and then you're going to start to, to feed. So the way you'll know if you're getting conditioning is if your dog starts to look and give you an, a look anticipatory when he sees the other dog. So over time, he will start to anticipate and you'll see that he gets that look that you kind of get, you know, when you go to the cookie jar, it's like, oh, this looks promising. So he'll see the other dog coming and look to you for his treat. So if you do this repeatedly, you'll, you'll the, the dog will start to, 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 to He's more. He's in more of a, a of a hurry to get to his treat than than you are. So, whatever the first tip off is that food is on the way. If that's another dog, then uh, then that's when he's going to start to to turn to you. So that sign that you're getting conditioning is that oh this looks promising. Rather than uh, looking for the treat, if you give the treat first or at the same time as the other dog appears, you won't get conditioning. That's why it's so important that you you that you see the other dog, then you wait for a, at least one second, and then you reach for your pocket, then you crinkle your bag, then all that other stuff happens. But first of all, the thing that you are trying to condition has to happen first. What are other ideas if your dog isn't very food motivated? Um, so all dogs are food motivated um, because otherwise they, they will die. Um, but some are more picky than others. Um, and uh, you, can, you might have to increase the value of the food. And the other way to is to use all food in training. So you don't put food in the bowl, you use it. And in fact, this is a, a, a kind of good, good thing to do anyway, to feed, you know, feed your, your dogs out of puzzle toys and Kongs and all of that sort of thing. But if you're trying to train your dog specifically, then it's what we call close the economy, all food in training. And that he will become much more motivated if, um, it, it, you know, if if he knows that okay, I, this is when I eat, um, and that but then if you've got fear, any time you're dealing with fear, you need 
kibble's not going to do it. You need to bring out the big guns, the chicken, the pecorino romano cheese, the sausage, the turkey, all of those sorts of things. Uh, you can use kibble for training a sit or a down, but fear, that needs, that needs the big stuff. Shannon wants to know if these same techniques work if the dog is overly excited, overly stimulated, rather than afraid. So, no, um, I would not use these. We don't need. We don't need to desensitize or counter condition a dog who is just excited. He, you know, we he already. We we in that case, in that situation. Um, we would teach an alternate behavior. The dog is not upset. Um, if he's just kind of, if he's jumping up, if he's excited, if he wants to go out for a walk, if he's anything like that, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, then um, then no, we would, we would teach an actual behavior. Because we didn't really talk, I didn't talk to, uh, too much today about, um, about the, 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 the you know the the process of teaching another behavior, but it can be done. Um, you can teach an alternative behavior, and you can do it in such a way that you get a side effect, a, a sort of positive emotional response as a side effect, if you do it conservatively enough. But if you have just a dog that's overexcited, I would just teach an alternative behavior. Really, teach a rock solid sit if if it's jumping, um, etc. But yeah, no, you don't need counter conditioning or or or, or, um, or uh, desensitization for a dog that's just just overexcited. Sally wants to know what to do when there are two dogs, but only one of the dogs has a barking problem. Um, so she trained the one dog. Uh, two dogs, um, I'm not quite sure what, are you talking about two dogs in a house uh, alert barking at the window or are you talking about two dogs in the street meeting each other or uh, I'm not sure, I need to know a bit more about the, um, the actual uh, circumstance, the, the scenario. Oh, is her dog staring out of a picture window a problem for the dog or is it just annoying to her? Um, so if the dog is is barking at the outside the window, uh, if, if I understand the question correctly, then um, uh, if if it's not if it's a if it's a, a watchdog kind of barking an alert kind of barking, then I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't actually use um, desensitization and counter conditioning. I just I would teach an, again an alternative alternative behavior, even a, a, a calm cue, a solid calm, a solid leave it. If it's if it's fearful barking, then I would use the um, the, the the desensitization and counter conditioning. Because ultimately, the question that you're always going to ask in terms of do you implement a, uh, a, um, uh, a, an operant protocol or a classical conditioning protocol is you're going to ask yourself, is my dog upset? Is my dog fearful? Is my dog uncomfortable? If he is, then you're going to go down the route that we talked about today of um, classical conditioning and counter conditioning and desensitization potentially. Um, if not, if he's just kind of being naughty as it were, then we teach an alternative behavior and potentially impose a penalty, a nonviolent penalty if, uh, if, if needed. Just to give you more information, she wrote back, it's not really barking, it's just obsessively staring. So is that a problem for the dog? Um, I don't really like to, because I don't know, I haven't seen the dog. If it's something that is new, if it's something that um, is striking you as, as, as problematic, um, 
I would get it checked out by a vet. Also, the earlier question about two dogs, it's two dogs in the house barking at the postman. So oh. one of them barks and the other doesn't. Oh, okay. So then, um, uh, then I would just, and the question was, what do you do? Do you just address the barking dog? Then yes, you're just going to just work with the barking dog. And when you say work with? In, in terms of stopping barking, um, I don't know that, I, I, well, I would teach an alternative behavior, but I don't really, I don't think this is quite the forum to address a sort of watchdog barking um, issue. But feel free to reach out to me separately and I can, um, I can talk to you more about that. Um, Ruth wants to know what bags do you use that a dog can't smell the treats? <laughs> great, 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 great question. Um, I quite often will um, use, do you know those little Gerber's baby food, um, small Gerber's baby food, turkey and beef um, little jars? Those are quite good. You can just pop them open. Um, but also I will use um, a tup Tupperware um, if I've got that. And then there's one other thing that you can do that is really, really helpful. If that all becomes too cumbersome, what you can do is wear your treat pouch with cheese or chicken in it around the house multi you know, for hours a day, reach into it, crinkle a bag and produce nothing so that putting on your treat pouch smelling of hot dogs that does not necessarily predict anything so you break that one to one ratio between um, the thing and the food which is which is what we want so if you are constantly walking around with a treat pouch and you're constantly walking around smelling of hot dog, um, but the dog doesn't get anything, he will soon sort of say to himself, oh, well, this is incredibly boring. I, I thought that something, she, she put her treat pouch on and she's got her crinkly bag and she's smelling of hot dog. Something's coming, something's coming. And if it doesn't, if you're constantly just saying, yeah, no, eventually he'll get bored. So then when, you, when the, uh, the trigger appears, that's when the hot dog appears so then you you can you can um, you can make it clear in your dog's mind that oh it's when the trigger appears that the hot dog um, that the hot dog starts flowing it's not when they put the pouch on it's not when they go around smelling of hot dog got it so there are those two different ways that you can do can um, that you can take to sort of abolishing the predictive power of cooking or of of the pouch or of the crinkle. But it's a very good question. Samantha and the rest of us want to know if her dog is smart enough to jump onto the couch deliberately because he knows he will get a treat when he gets off. <laughs> yes. Um, well, he... Uh, he will cease getting a treat uh, once he gets um, once he learns that the uh, that he gets the treat when he comes off, um, and if he then starts if you get a, a chain reaction, um, then we're just going to have to block the um, uh, either block the sofa for him getting back up for temporarily while you're training that he gets no, if he gets back up again, and then you're going to uh, signal him off, but he's not going to get anything. Once he knows that off, he, he doesn't get anything. Kelly writes that my dog acts fearful going outside in the hallway, elevator, and outside, but when we are getting ready and ask him if he wants to go out, 
he gets excited and actually goes to the door, getting his halter on, tail is up and wagging. Am I just misreading him? He seems to like the idea of going outside, but is fearful once we get going. And that is really, really common and sad. And um, I, I feel so much for, for, for dogs like yours, and it's not uncommon. They think they want to go out, they really want to explore, um, but then they just get overwhelmed when they're out there and they realize, you yeah, know, I really thought I wanted to go out and I'm so excited, but oh no, I can't, I can't handle it. And so um, in, in the case of a dog like that, I will just expose them gradually, 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 even if they want to go out. If they are, uh, I would uh, uh, just take them as far as, as far as they get before they start getting fearful and then just build from there and again I'm happy to sort of talk in more detail but that's that's a really that's a really difficult not difficult but it's it's a common thing where the dog is conflicted wants to go out but is too fearful it's like you kind of want to go swimming but you're fearful of the of the pool, et cetera, et cetera. You love the idea of it. I love the idea of horse riding, but when I'm actually on a horse, uh, I'm terrified. So, um, so yeah, so it's just a question of, of building up really, really slowly. And in the meantime, by the way, if you can take him for as many walks as possible to places where he's not fearful, like to, to, to Rock Creek Park, to, to uh, to trails, to the country, to Congressional Cemetery, to the various places where um, where there's not a lot of traffic, where there's not a lot of noise, and gradually keep them, uh, give, uh, get them to have lovely outside time that doesn't necessarily be mean being fearful. This next question is a little, you may need more information, you may need to see the dogs it's i have two dogs and they get excited seeing other dogs stare and jump because they want to play they're large breed what would be the best method the best method for that is uh this question is very similar to the early questions um very very similar i.e i would train an alternate behavior um and uh that they can't do and lunge at the same time. So you train that um, like a leave it. So you train them to leave something. As you are walking past, they turn to you and they get treats as they walk past and on you go. So, but you have, you have to uh, train this behavior, first of all, in the house, and then in the yard, and then in the quiet, uh, quiet street, and then gradually increase the, you know, do it with the dog far away, and then closer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The there, there is a process to these things. You, there's a kind of you build up incrementally. There's, it's not like it's a, a an instant, uh, an instant solution, but it can be very powerful. You just think, okay, what what can my dog do, um, that will interfere with him jump, uh, barking and lunging. Well, if he looks and looks at you, um, he can't bark, bark and lunge at the same time. So you really train that alternative behavior, make it very, very strong. Is that it, Deborah? In your presentation, there was a dog um, that was initially fearful, but eventually was able to walk around the block. And Nadia wanted to know if that was weeks, months, Days, how long did that take to get to that place? Mm -hmm. So it took probably um, three, th maybe three months of intermittent right. training. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the owners went away for a short period of time and then Tuck had a, had a, um, a relapse because he went to stay with some friends and there was something that really scared him so he relapsed and by the way these 
desensitization and counter conditioning programs t do take a long time and they they are not linear that relapses plateaus are all part of the process um, also tuck he has a sort of a kidney problem so was not able to take any kind of medication um, and very often vets um, and the vets you, when you talk to them you know very often a case like this will be helped um, with the support of a, of a vet or a veterinary behaviorist um, in Tuck's case it was pure uh, behavior mod there was no, no no support and so he did extremely well he did really and his, his owners they did very very well And here's a question from Blake. How do I get my puppy to get more comfortable to pee outside? My, well, he is comfortable using the turf on our terrace, but gets distracted and almost never goes outside. So basically, you want to make sure that you, um, you might have to take him out and um, walk for a long time until he pees outside and then you want to be ready to reward very heavily so he sort of he does it once and then he gets all this cheese and chicken and he's like wait wait what whoa what was that why did I huh I'll do that again and the because dogs will do what works and if peeing outside is what's going to um, produce chicken, then he will do that more often. So the, 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 the tricky part in the beginning is to get him to do it at all. And so for that, you're just going to have to, like for example, first thing in the morning when he wakes up, whisk him outside um, uh, and then as soon as he pees, he gets heavily rewarded and then just you know practice that um, so that he develops a kind of preference for uh, for being outside for being outside Ruth wants to know um, her dog barks at people when they come to the door it seems you can't treat when opening the door because the dog will figure that they're getting treats for barking if your dog is barking at people when they come in because they are afraid of the person or because they're saying, hey, I don't want you to come into the apartment or into the house. I'm uncomfortable. Either you're scaring me or I, I you know, this is my, my space. Um, if that's the reason for the barking, then, um, uh, and if you feed, you're not going to that won't be rewarding the barking because your dog isn't barking because he's getting chicken he's barking because he's afraid um, and he's worried he's upset so what i would do in that case is if somebody comes to the door i would put your dog behind a baby gate and feed once he's behind the baby gate so that every time somebody comes to the house and comes in the house he gets food because then what he's going to learn is that people coming to the house predicts really great stuff for your dog and if you do that every single time he'll start to say oh wow i love it when people come to the house it means i get a whole load of um, chicken or a Kong filled with chicken or a lovely bully stick, something that is going to be associated with people coming to the house. And Kelly has a question that I love, especially before the 4th of July. She's read different things and what she wants to know is, is it problematic to comfort your fearful dog? No, it's not problematic. <laughs> <laughs> not problematic and I know there's a huge some sort of myth 
um, out their wives' tale, a literal old wives' tale, that somehow or other you can reinforce fear by comforting. Um, and that's just simply not the case. I mean, that's like, you know, uh, you, sort of you're, you're, you're afraid um, of, of spiders and, and, and you see them coming towards you. Um, and if you get comfort, if somebody gives you, you know, a box of chocolates or, or a hug, you're not going to feel more afraid of the spiders. You know, comfort is not going to increase your fear. So it's, um, you, you can't reinforce fear. So absolutely 100% comfort your dog, feed your dog during fireworks, um, make it as happy as a as possible take your dog to a to a safe space maybe to a closet where it's um where he can get away to a little den you know put put happy uh, put um cheese put a bully stick in the closet make it as as um as comfortable as possible um uh, so they feel safe put on um white noise machines the tv um and yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you for answer, asking that question though. And I believe that's the end of the questions. Thank you, Tony, so much. This was really informative. You're very welcome. Thank you very much everybody for, for joining. Bye everyone.